We're back already. Chapter 7 of To Kill a Mockingbird. In Chapter 6, they, Dill and Jem and Scout, decided to go to um, try and look in Boo Radley's window. Scout didn't want to do it. She didn't think it was a good idea. She knew that her dad did not want them messing with them at all. But Dill and Jem really felt like they wanted to do it. And again, she was called a girl, like it's a bad word. Um, she did go with them. And even though they were trying to be careful, they couldn't look through the window that had the shutter. They tried to go to the back of the house and look in. But Mr. Nathan Radley, who is Boo Radley's brother, heard them, came out with a shotgun and shot in the air to scare off whoever it was. As they were working to get away and crawl un back under the fence that they'd used to get in, Dill's pants got caught, or Jem's pants got caught, and he took his pants off so he could get out. Pantsless. Ugh, embarrassing. He did go back later that night to get them in the dark of night, and Scout did not want him to go. She begged him to not, but he did. He went back by himself to get his pants. Now we're on to chapter 7. <clears throat> Jim stayed moody and silent for a week. As Atticus had once advised, us, advised me to do, I tried to climb into Jim's skin and walk around in it. If I'd gone alone to the Radley place at 2 in the morning, my funeral would have been held the next afternoon. So I left Jim alone and tried not to bother him. School started. The second grade was as bad as the first, only worse. They still flashed cars at you and wouldn't let you read or write. Miss Caroline's progress next door could be estimated by the frequency of laughter. However, the usual crew that flunked the first grade again were helpful in keeping order. The only thing good about the second grade was that this year I had to stay as late as Jim, and we usually walked home together at 3 o'clock. One afternoon when we were crossing the schoolyard toward home, Jim suddenly said, there's something I didn't tell you. At this was his first complete sentence in several days. I encouraged him. About what? About that night. Well, you've never told me anything about that night, I said. Jim waved his hand word waved my words away as if fanning gnats. He was silent for a while, and then he said, When I went back for my breeches, well they were all tangled up. When I was getting out of them, I couldn't get him loose. And when I went back, Jim took a deep breath. When I went back, they were folded across the fence like they were expecting me. Across. And something else, Jim's voice was flat. I'll show you when we get home. They've been sewed up. Not like a lady sewed them, like something I try to do, all, all crooked. It's almost like somebody knew you was coming back for him. Jim shuddered, like somebody was reading my mind, like somebody could tell that what I was going to do. Can't anybody tell what I'm going to do lest that they know me, can they, Scout? Jim's question was an appeal. Well, I reassured him. Can't anybody tell you what you're going to do lest they live in the house with you. Even I can't tell sometimes. We were walking past our tree, and in its knot hole rested a ball of gray twine. Don't take it, Jim, I said. This is somebody's hiding hole. I don't think so, Scout. Yes, it is. Somebody like Walter Cunningham comes down here every recess and hides his things, and we come along and we take him away from him. Listen, let's leave it and wait a couple days, and if it ain't gone, and then we'll take it, okay? Okay. You might be a rat, Jim said. It must be some little kid's place. Hides his things from the bigger folks. You know it's only when school's in that we found things. Yeah, I said, but we never go by here in the summer. And we went home. Next morning, the Tron was there, and we left it. When it was still there, on the third day, Jim pocketed it. From then on, we considered everything we found in the knot hole our property. The second grade was grim. But Jim assured me that the older I got, the better school would be, and that he started off the same way. It was not until we reached 
one reached the sixth grade that one learned anything of value. The sixth grade seemed to please him from the beginning. He went through a brief Egyptian period that baffled me. He tried to walk flat a great deal, sticking one arm in front of him and one arm in back, putting one foot behind the other. He declared Egyptians walk that way. I said if they did, I didn't see how they got anything done. But Jim said that they accomplished more than the Americans ever did. They invented toilet paper and perpetual embalming and asked where would we be today if they hadn't. Atticus told me to delete the adjectives and that I'd have facts. There are no clearly defined seasons in South Alabama. Summer drifts into autumn, and autumn is sometimes never followed by winter, but turns to a, to a day's old spring that melts like summer again. Well, that fall was a long one, hardly cool enough for a light jacket. Jim and I were trotting in our orbit one mild October afternoon when our knot hole stopped us again. Something white was inside this time. Jim let me do the honors. I pulled out two small images carved in soap. One was the figure of a boy, and the other wore a crude dress. Before I remembered that there was no such thing as hoodooing, I shrieked and I threw him down. Jim snatched him up. What's the matter with you, he yelled. He rubbed the figures free of red dust. These are good, he said. I've never seen any of these good. He held them down to me, and they were almost perfect miniatures of two children. The boy had on shorts, and a shock of soapy hair fell to his eyebrows. He looked a lot like... I looked up at Jim. A point of straight brown hair kicked downwards from his eyes. Hmm. I'd never noticed it before. Jim looked from the girl doll to me. The girl doll wore bangs. So did I. These are us, he said. Who did them, you reckon? Who do we know around here who whittles, he asked. Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery just, just does like this. I, I mean carves. Mr. Avery averaged a stick of stove wood per week. He honed it down to a toothpick and chewed it. There's old Miss Stephanie's sweetheart, I said. Well, he carves all white, right, but he lives down the country. When would he ever pay any attention to us? Maybe he sits on the porch and looks at us instead of Miss Stephanie. If I was him, I would. Jim stared at me so long. I asked what was the matter. I got nothing. Scout for an answer. And when we went home, Jim put the dolls in his trunk. Less than two weeks later, we found a whole package of chewing gum, which we enjoyed. Uh, the fact that everything on the Radley place was poison having slipped Jim's memory. The following week, the knot hole yielded harnessed metal. Jim showed it to Atticus, who said it was a spelling medal, that before we were born, the Macon County schools had spelling contests and awarded medals to the winners. Addis Kiss said somebody must have lost it, and had we asked around. Jim Camel kicked me when I tried to say where we found it. Jim asked Atticus if he remembered anybody who ever won one, and Atticus said no. Our biggest prize appeared four days later. It was a pocket watch that wouldn't run on a chain with an aluminum knife. You reckon it's rock gold, Jim? Don't know. I'll show it to Atticus. Atticus said it would probably be worth ten dollars, knife, chain, and all, if it were new. Did you swap with somebody at school, he asked. No, sir. Jim pulled out his grandfather's watch that Atticus had let him carry once a week if Jim were careful with it. On the days he carried the watch, Jim walked on eggs. Atticus, if it's all right with you, I, I'd rather have this one instead. Maybe I can fix it. When the new wore off his grandfather's watch and carrying it became a day's burden, burdensome task, Jim no longer felt the necessity of a certain hour every five minutes. He did a fair job. Only one spring and two tiny pieces left over, but the watch would not run. Ah, oh, he sighed. It'll never go. Scout? Huh? You reckon we ought to write a letter to whoever is leaving us these things? Well, that'd be nice, right, right nice, Jim. We can thank him. What's wrong? Jim was holding his ears, shaking his head from side to side. I don't get it. I just don't get it. 
I don't know why. Scout looked toward the living room. He looked toward the living room. <clears throat> I've got a good mind to tell Atticus. <sighs> no, I reckon not. I'll tell him for you. No, don't do that, Scout. Scout? What? He'd been on the verge of telling me something all evening. His face would brighten, and then he would lean toward me, and then he would change his mind. He changed it again. <sighs> Nothing. Here, let's write a letter. I pushed a tablet and pencil under his nose. Okay. Dear mister, well, how do you know it's a man? It might be, I bet it's Miss Marty. Been betting that for a long time. Ah, Miss Marty can't chew gum. Jim broke into a grin. You know, she can talk real pretty sometimes. One time, I asked her to have a chew, and she said no thanks, but chewing gum cleaved to her palate and rendered her speechless. Jim said carefully, doesn't that sound nice? Yeah, yeah, she can say nice things sometimes. She wouldn't have a watch and chain anyway. Dear sir, said Jim, we appreciate the, no, we appreciate everything which you've put in the tree for us. Yours truly, Jeremy Atticus Finch. He won't know who you are if you sign it like that, Jim. Jim erased his name and he wrote, Jim Finch. I signed, Jean Louise Finch, Scout, in parentheses, beneath it. And Jim put the note in an envelope. Next morning, on the way to school, he ran ahead of me and he stopped at the tree. Jim was facing me when he looked up and I saw him go stark white. Scout! I ran to him. Someone had filled our knot hole with cement. I ran to him. Don't cry now, Scout. Don't cry. Don't you worry. He muttered at me all the way to school. When we went home for dinner, Jim bolted his food, ran to the porch, and stood on the steps. I followed him. It hasn't passed by yet, he said. Next day, Jim repeated his vigil, and he was rewarded. Howdy, Mr. Nathan, he said. Morning, Jim, Scout said Mr. Radley as he went by. Mr. Radley, said Jim. Mr. Radley turned around. Mr. Radley, uh, did you put cement in that hole in the tree down yonder? Yes, he said. I filled it up. Well, why'd you do it, sir? The tree's dying. You plug them up with cement when they're sick. You ought to know that, Jim. Jim said nothing about it until late afternoon. When we passed the tree, he gave it a meditative pat on the cement, and he remained deep in thought. He seemed to be working himself into a bad humor, so I kept my distance. As usual, we met Atticus coming home from work that evening. and we were at our steps, Jim said, Atticus, look down yonder at that tree, please, sir. What tree, son? One in the corner of the Radley lot, coming from school. Yes. Is that tree dying? Why, no, son, I don't think so. Look at the leaves. They're all green and full, no brown patches anywhere. I ain't even sick. That tree's as healthy as you are, Jim. Why? Mr. Nathan Radley said it was dying. Hmm. Well, maybe it is. I'm sure Mr. Radley knows more about his trees than we do. Atticus left us on the porch. Jim leaned on a pillar, rubbing his shoulders against it. Do you itch, Jim? I said as politely as I could. He did not answer. Come on in, Jim, I said. After a while. He stood there until nightfall, and I waited for him. And when we went in the house, I saw he'd been crying. His face was dirty in the right places, but I thought it odd that I had not heard him. And that is the end of chapter 7. So, who do you think is putting things in that tree? Seems pretty clear that Mr. Nathan Radley seems to have an idea of who might be putting things in that tree. Now, remember at the very beginning of the book, the very first thing that she says is, when he was nearly 13, my brother Jem got his arm badly broken at the elbow. And she said, when enough years went by, we discussed the events that led into it. I maintain that the Yule started it all, but Jem, who was four years my senior, said it started long before that. He said it began the summer Dill came to us. 
So 13. We are getting close to that time period. Jem is about 12 years old right now. And he broke his arm. Broke it pretty badly that it bent all weird. And she, Scout says she thinks it's because of the Yules. We've only met that one Bureau's Yule in first grade, so there's a lot that we still have to f figure out. But we have learned a lot about the Radleys and about Boo Radley. Real things, not so real things. And if he's the one who's leaving those things on the tree, I mean, he's not leaving bad things, so maybe he's not so bad. And Jem's reaction, maybe he's realizing that maybe this person in that house is not so bad and they're kind of trying to reach out. On Wednesday, I'm going to be reading live on conferences at 1 p.m. I will post and remind you about this. Don't forget to take quizzes six and seven, which should already be listed and they are open and you they're resumable and you can take them up to five times. I've also opened quizzes eight and nine in case you are reading ahead, which is fine. And um, in any event, I will see you on Wednesday. I hope you have a great couple of days.